Again, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to our first quarterly webcast of the year. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Jake Eggett. I'm part of the advisory team here at Copper Wind Financial. Um, apparently, I drew the short end of the, the straw today because I'll, I'll be moderating, so bear with us. But I'm, I'm also joined by uh, David Daughtry and Linda Ely, and we're going to excuse uh, Eric Newton, who is out of town today. So, so, to, so to get started, we just have a couple of uh, housekeeping items we usually like to tell people about. Everybody came onto this Zoom on mute. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you, though, and the way to do that is through the uh, question and answer button. You'll see a little icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, go ahead and type in any questions you, you have there, and we hope to get to those at the end. Uh, we've prepared about 30 to 35 minutes of, of prepared remarks, and then uh, we'll spend the, the remaining time just getting to all the questions. And then at the very end of the presentation, uh, you'll, you'll get a short three-question survey just to provide some feedback. We always appreciate anybody that adds any feedback there or just as a way to help us make these better. So, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. This is, uh, this is just a, our simple agenda for the call today. We're gonna spend just a few minutes talking about 2021. Uh, we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about 2022 and why we see it being a year of transition. And then we'll end with kind of our 2022 outlook and what we've done within the strategies uh, currently. So, so let's go ahead and get started and talk about what moved the markets last year. Now, this is just a timeline we put together to kind of give you a sense of, of what were some of the major headlines. You know, a little over a year ago, we had Joe Biden become the 46th president of the United States. Uh, followed. Following that, there was a really interesting headline with meme stocks um, just kind of exploding. GameStop was the, you know, the darling of it. But, you know, a lot of this was due to free government, free government money that was given to individuals. And there was a lot of speculation that was um, that really ignited from retail investors through a Reddit thread. And so we saw some of these meme stocks go up thousands of percent in a very short period of time. Um, most of those have, have fallen back to, to earth now and, uh, and, and, and are trading at more normal levels, but they, they, they definitely ignored fundamentals and that uh, made for a very interesting headline. The, the biggest headline really is the thing that you see in the middle of the page is inflation. You know, inflation is measured by the consumer price index hit 7%, which is the highest uh, in the last 40 years. Or, um, and that was mostly driven by kind of the ongoing pandemic, which we're all involved with, that has created some supply chain disruptions throughout the world. But we've seen inflation through everything from food to energy prices to, to rent that we have on there, housing. I mean, housing went up nearly 20% last year, which is one of the biggest uh, increases we've seen on record. But it wasn't just housing. I mean, on the right-hand side, the Federal Reserve, they increased their balance sheet by $1.4 trillion, which is uh, the second most on record. Um, we also saw the federal debt go um, surpass $29 trillion for the first time, and now is at $30 trillion as of today. So, so those are some of the main major headlines. So how did the markets do? Um, <clears throat> if you look, it was the US continued to be the best place to be, but it was a mixed bag. And I'll, I'll kind of get into some of these details. You know, US large caps did extremely well, up 28, uh, a little over 28% when you include the dividends. But if you were to tell me that um, we were gonna have a really strong economy, and uh, the market was gonna trend up, I would normally have told you that small caps would have done better than large caps, and that wasn't the case. And part of that was driven by, you see in this on the right-hand side, these style boxes, small cap growth, the bottom right-hand corner, you know, that really dragged down uh, small cap. And so the large cap was the place to be, and that's been the trend for a long time now. Um, it's a place that we've, 
spent most uh, concentrated most of our investing in the large cap space because of that trend. But when you look at international markets, um, you know they did okay as well. Developed markets had low bit double digit returns, but emerging markets didn't do that well at all. I mean, they were basically flat for the year. Some emerging markets uh, were down quite a bit. You know, as you turn to bonds, um, bonds lost money last year, mostly because of rising rates. And over the last 40 years, we've only had four years where bonds, where the US aggregate bond index lost money, last year being one of them. Fortunately for us, we were in the right areas. Our bond portfolio made money last year. Um, and so it just, just goes to show that that's normally a, a place that doesn't lose a lot of money, but we're seeing, uh, we're seeing quite a bit of pressure on the bond side right now. And then lastly, when we talked inflation, these are two areas that you normally see as kind of inflation hedges. Real estate had a very nice year, but gold surprisingly lost money last year in a time when inflation was the highest we've seen in 40 years, gold being down. That was a big surprise. So didn't, didn't seem to work quite as well as an inflation head, hedge this last year. So that's kind of the summary we had for 2021. Let's go ahead and jump into 2022 and why we see it being a year of transition. And we've created this slide as, a, as really talking points for our whole discussion today. So uh, let me walk through just a quick little summary and on the left-hand side, you see 2021 and some of the, the main topics. And, and then 2022 on the right-hand side is what we see, you know, maybe being characterized this, characterizing this year a little bit. So, you know, the last several years uh, has been characterized by a lot of free money. So stimulus money being given to individuals. And that's led to uh, quite a dramatic effect when, it, when you look at consumers and corporations and even the economy. You know, that effect may be wearing off. I mean, we, we, we will see if they are able to pass any additional stimulus with the Build Back Better plan. Um, but even if it does get passed, it will probably be a lot less than, than where it started at. The other thing in 2021 was the Fed was very accommodative low rates continued and they were expanding their balance sheet, you know, their, their tune has changed a little bit. They, they anticipate raising rates and potentially towards the end of the year that we could see some balance sheet reduction. And so that may create a headwind for the markets. We've been talking a lot for several times about how valuations have been extended. That has continued, but there has been a bit of correction specifically on the high growth stocks that has, um, has reduced some of those valuations over the past year. If rates continue to increase, we may, we may continue to see that, that correction continue. Um, and then as it, as it relates to inflation, you know, the Fed had talked about all last year or most of last year is saying that it was transitory. They've certainly changed their tune. We expect to see this year more things that are maybe transitory and, and what things are persistent. So we'll go into that into some detail there. And then lastly, I think we're all tired of the pandemic, obviously. Um, we'll see if COVID becomes endemic and maybe it turns into you know, a seasonal flu, we'll see. Um, I think a bit, big headline was last year, we had quite a bit of smooth sailing in the markets. And what I mean by that is the worst drop we saw last year in the S&P was about 5%. That is very abnormal. You know, we anticipate seeing some normal volatility this year. And then just to kind of sum it up, corporations and consumers were very strong last year. We, we anticipate that continuing, uh, but there'll probably be a little bit of compression there. Okay, so with that being said, that, uh, let's just go ahead and dive into the details of some of these. And I'll turn the time over to Dave to talk through the free government money and the free money effect. Sounds good. I, I like to talk about free money. That's good. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jake. So what we've got here is a, a couple of graphs. And the first one is uh, about federal debt. I mean, that's where a lot of the free money came from, especially during the pandemic and since it started. Uh, and, and we've rapidly you know, expanded the debt uh, to now it's 30 trillion. This is a, a little bit 
uh, lagged on, on, on the graph, but that's money that went out to individuals and stimulus packages, tax cuts, uh, uh, PPP loans to businesses, monies to hospitals, monies to local and state governments. So a lot of money flowing out there. Uh, the other source of free money was the Federal Reserve. They printed now nearly $9 trillion out of thin air and bought bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And you saw a huge jump in that uh, during when the pandemic started and ever since. And that has been a tailwind for the market, really for the last decade, but especially the last two years. And now they're talking about stopping that or reversing that. And all that is added to the money supply. And the bottom chart is the M2 money supply, which is cash, checking accounts, uh, money market, CDs, everything that you can easily convert into cash and go spend. Uh, and it, it's jumped from 15 or 16 trillion to 21 and a half trillion. So a lot of money slash, sloshing around there, a lot of it out to consumers. And let's look at what consumers do with it when they get it. Well, as you know, most of them spend it. <clears throat> I will tell you, though, that the consumers have saved a lot also. And part of that is for savings, because during the lockdown, you couldn't go out and spend money. But uh, what you see in this chart, this is consumer spending going back to 2012. And for the basically the first eight years, it was a fairly steady, nice upward sloping line. And then with the pandemic, it dropped dramatically, but came back with the stimulus payments. And we're way above trend line on consumer spending. And right now there is still some pent up demand. If you look and say, I want this specific car with these specific features and you go down to the dealership, you're gonna be disappointed because they're gonna say, well, we can probably order that and you'll get it sometime in the future. A lot of dislocation uh, on the consumer spending side of not being able to buy what you want. And uh, that bodes well for the economy going forward. If you look at corporate profits, uh, consumers spend, and that's 68% of, of the GDP, and corporations reap the profits from that. So we see record corporate profits, both from consumer spending and really also some efficiencies. A lot of corporations have made changes, were forced to basically during the pandemic to be more efficient in how they produce goods and services. <clears throat> so you'll... Uh, you're, you're seeing that record corporate profits. And when, when people say, you know, uh, the you know, stock market's gone up way too much, corporate profits are one of the things that's driving that. And that's a positive. But if you look at the labor market, and I love this chart, I'm sure you guys are looking and saying, why, why would you love a chart like that? But uh, I, I, I like the data. But the orange line is the number of people unemployed. It goes back to 2007. And the blue uh, line is job openings. In other words, jobs that are being offered that haven't been filled. And as for most of that time frame, you see the blue line is below the, the, the orange line because you know we had higher unemployment. But now, and it, it actually started occurring in 2018, 19, but now you say there's 10.9 million job openings and 6.5 million people unemployed. So every unemployed person, for every unemployed person, there's 1.7 jobs that are being offered out there. So anybody that wants a job and is willing and is qualified for that job and or sometimes there's location issues and is willing to relocate, they can get a job. Uh, best job market I've seen in my entire life. And I'm not any spring chicken, so it's been a long time. Uh, but it's, it's, it's very good and it's very healthy for the economy. So if we go and look and say, what has that done for the economy? And, and both the, the corporate profits, the consumer spending, and uh, the, the, the jobs, what you see, and we only went back a couple of years here, 2018 and 19, GDP was between 2 and 3%. And you can go back another eight or nine years, and it's always between one and a half and two and a half or three percent. During the pandemic, huge gyrations as we shut down and then reopened the economy. But last year, as it was reopened, I mean, we had 5.7 percent GDP growth. We haven't seen that in decades. And this year is going to be not quite as good because, you know, some of everybody's desire to purchase things, some of that's been satisfied, but it's probably going to be north of 4%. And global growth is going to be north of 4%, which is a very healthy growth clip. And I will tell you one thing that gives me a little comfort is that we've never had a recession when global growth has been 4% or higher. 
So uh, all of those things have combined to, to be a very healthy economy from that standpoint. Uh, if we go and look and say, what, what is causing uh, you know, this? What's the, the heating up, the steam that's coming off of uh, a really hot economies across the, uh, the, the globe? And I love this little cartoon, is it global warming? No, it's monetary policy. And that's truly the case. If you, from the Fed, it's not just our Fed, uh, Bank of Japan, Bank of England, European Central Bank, Bank of China, all of them have been printing money and having extremely low interest rates. <clears throat> and because of that, uh, you, you're seeing you know, uh, them having to look and say, are we changing that? And that's why Jake said, it's a transition of the Fed and other central banks having a tailwind on the market and on risk assets versus being you know, sort of a, a headwind. So this is the Fed policy looking at it from a balance sheet standpoint and the return on the S&P 500. And the most powerful economic person in the world is Chairman Powell. It's not a president, it's not a prime minister, it's Chairman Powell. Because what the Fed does makes more economic uh, impact than anything else anybody does. Now, what this does on the left-hand side is the Fed balance sheet. And the line uh, is going up and that, you know, uh, that, that is the balance sheet. Assets that they have where they printed money out of thin air and bought bonds or you know, uh, mortgage-backed securities. If you're in Japan, they actually bought stocks. But here it's been just bonds and mortgage-backed security. The, the two rectangle boxes that are black, that's when they were increasing, they were adding to the balance sheet. The red is when they were, they say, quantitative tightening or uh, you know, the, the, the runoff in that balance sheet. Uh, and when you compare it to what's happening on uh, the S&P 500 index, you see that those same, during the, that same time when we have quantitative easing, the market goes up and in the last quantitative easing because it, the quantitative easing was so fast and their balance sheet went up so quickly uh, that that's exactly what the stock market did. If you go to the quantitative tightening and it's a small portion of that total time frame, uh, the S&P, it still was positive, but it was volatile and not near as going up as fast. So that's the concern of, of quantitative tightening here. And uh, the other thing that the Fed does is they you know, control short-term interest rates. <clears throat> and you've probably heard uh, on, on CNBC or Bloomberg or one of those or Fox Business where they talk about the dot plots. And that is the FOMC, which is the Federal Open Market Committee that sets interest rates, short-term rates, uh, overnight rates between banks. And this dot plot, is where the members and each one of those dots is a, a member's uh, forecast of what they think interest rates, short-term interest rates will be in the future. And for a long time, the last two years, we were at zero at, at 0.1, uh, going now to 0.9 and by the end of the year at 1.6 and a couple of years out at 2.5 to 3%. So they're expecting those rates to go up. And those rates on the short term, they control, they will go up if they want them to go up. The question that the market has, and really everybody does, is, well, will long-term rates go up? Will mortgage rates go up? Will 10-year treasuries go up? Well, we have a precedent of what happened the last time in that quantitative tightening <clears throat> that we talked about. And so if we look at, uh, if you can go to the next slide, Jake, uh, the global yield, so we're looking at uh, the, the blue is the U.S. Treasury, 10-year Treasury, and then you've got government bonds from Germany and Japan. What you see is their rates are dramatically lower than ours. And if you go, and Jake, maybe you could point to there at the top in 2018 for the U.S., uh, we, that's when we started tightening. And you'd say, okay, so rates went up, right? Not really. They actually went down. And why did they go down? because our rates were so much higher than the German and Japanese rates that investors from there came to the US, bought US dollar denominated treasuries and in more uh, amounts in, than, than the Fed had been doing. So they replaced the Fed and rates went down. So the consensus right now is rates are gonna go up, mortgage rates are gonna go up, 10 years gonna go up and they may, and that's probably the highest probability trade. 
but the, there's a scenario where they don't or short-term rates come up to where long-term rates and they call that a flat yield curve. We're starting to see that. I mean, it was, okay, it's here. Now it's sort of like there and it could get to a flat yield curve. So that will be the biggest impact and it'll impact uh, some of the other risk assets like real estate. And we'll talk a little bit about that you know, here shortly. But if you look at the valuations of the market, and this is just looking at the S&P 500, these are, uh, each line is a, a valuation metric, price to earnings ratio, price to, uh, price to book, price to sales, uh, market cap to GDP, all of those types of uh, metrics that say to measure whether the market is cheap or fairly priced or expensive. So the way to read this chart is that if it's in the green, the green represents, okay, it's cheap. The red and purple are, it's, it's really expensive. And the black line is a status bar line to say, where are we right now? Well, it's pretty easy to see. In most cases, we're pegging the right side or pretty close to it, meaning we're at the extreme of being highly valued. And think back to the late nineties with dot-com bubble, that's where you would have been. Uh, there's a few that are not, but uh, that, that is the concern as far as valuation. And you look and say, well, why would you have any stock if it's valued like that? Well, because a year ago, I could have said the same thing. Three or four years ago, I could have said the same thing. Those are things that you look at. And, and you did say that, I think, last year and the year before. And the year that, before. that is true. I tend to repeat myself, and, and, and it has been correct. I mean, the market... As long as corporate profits go up, it can stay high for a long period of time. Uh, just like you could have looked at real estate back in 2005 and said, oh, it's really expensive. Well, here in Arizona, it went up another, I don't know, 25, 30% before it crashed. So uh, the, the valuation is a concern, but in a low rate environment, it, it can last for a while. And when you look at inflation, this is a chart goes back all the way to World War I. And none of you guys were around in World War I when we had high inflation. But most of you can, can look and say, well, I do remember in the 70s and early 80s when we had double-digit inflation and more than a decade with high single-digit inflation. And then we had what we call the Great Moderation. If you remember, the Federal Reserve pushed interest rates, prime rate went to 21%, mortgages were 15%. And they stomped uh, on inflation and did a fantastic job for, because for 40 years, we've had what we call the great moderation. And now with the COVID surge <clears throat> and what we're seeing, people are concerned, are we going to get back to the 1970s, 1980s, or you know, back uh, even further? But the chart, the, the, the chart here in the bottom right, that's the important piece. So on the first, uh, the, the, the first column there is, CPI, Consumer Price Index, and how much it goes up each year. And it goes from below 1% all the way to above 9%. But if you go over into the third and fourth columns, real GDP and S&P 500 returns, what you see is if you've got low inflation, it's great. It's great for GDP. It's great for the S&P. You got high inflation, it's not great for anything. Uh, you know, might have been in the past gold, and that's about it. So, that's why people are getting concerned and why the market's getting concerned about inflation. Because if inflation is there and it stays high, it is hard to make money in stocks. It's hard to make money as a business. One of the things that they're talking about is, is, is inflation transitory or is it in more in, 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 entrenched here? And this is where Chairman Powell made a strategic blunder back in the summer when he said, oh, it's, we're going to be fine by the end of the year. Don't worry about it. Well, you were seeing wage increases significantly. It, it, there were significant wage increases. And here we go back to 2016 pre-COVID, uh, uh, but you could go back 10 years from the start of COVID. You'd see the same thing. Two to three percent uh, average annual uh, wage growth. This is an average hourly earnings. Since COVID, we're up five percent, and some of the recent stuff, it was like nearly seven <clears throat> percent. So, I give somebody a raise. It's like giving a toy to a child. You can't take it back without a lot of crying and and you know people getting really upset. And you're not going to take those back. Those are going to build into your cost structure and you're going to pass those on. 
there are other things that are more transitory. And, and you know, if we look at that, uh, one of the perfect examples is, you know, the supply chain disruption. When I say supply chain disruption, you hear it all the time. But an easy thing, supply chain disruption means getting products from one place to where they're needed another. It can be oil to the refinery. It can be grain to the, the you know, the, the, the baker. Uh, and then it can be the manufacturer that takes those and taking them to the consumer. And when that gets disrupted, you still have demand. You don't have enough supply and prices go up. That's just the way economics work. We've seen it uh, all, all, all the way from you know, oil that for the last decade, you've had some of the supply you know, chain stuff of stuff shutting down and, and that going up and down. And oil has been that way. It's not built in inflationary. It doesn't just go up, it goes up, comes back down. Those are transitory things. Right now, go out, try to go out and buy a, a car and I want all of these things on it. You're gonna be disappointed. Uh, car prices have gone up, you know, used car prices, 30% in two years. It's crazy. That's not going to hold. Why? Because right now they can't get chips to build new cars, but we're not running out of chips. They will make the chips. Same way lumber. We've seen it. We've talked about it in other webinars. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up. We're not running out of timber. It's a disruption and it will get sorted out. And once it does, those transitory things will go away. And so I think uh, the question is, how much is transitory? I think the labor is not transitory, but I think most of the others uh, are, are transitory. So I think, you know, you're, you're going to have some disruptions in the market as people try to figure this out and as the Fed tries to figure it out. But I wanted uh, to turn it over to Linda to talk about the biggest product that most people buy in their entire lives, and that's housing. Linda, go ahead. Thanks, David. And good afternoon, everybody. Well, you would have had to have been spending the last year living in a cave if you missed uh, the mania that's been in the housing market, right? And, and, and in the face of all odds. I mean, how do you have a housing price war in the middle of a pandemic? Well, like most of the challenges we've been facing since uh, the global shutdown, this one also has multiple layers. Now, first, we get to, to blame the millennials again for, for putting off buying a home until later in life. But you also had people who were working from home and now realized, well, home could be anywhere. And you had builders who, following the financial crisis of 2008, where they got burnt pretty badly, they've spent the past decade underbuilding uh, with the thought of that pain very, very clear in their minds. And then let's layer in the supply chain disruptions that David was just talk talking about, which has led to a lack of availability on just about everything at some point in time, whether it's appliances or toilets or trusses anything you need to build a house, which has then made it take longer to build a house. And so then you have excessive demand in places that, that never had demand. You know, Idaho became the hottest real estate market last year. And, and all of this just translates into supply in the wrong places, not enough of it, lots of people looking for stuff, higher prices, supply and demand. So if we look at the historical trend line on housing, for example, and Jake, if you back up one, there you go, thanks. Um, in the past, uh, we, we see typically an average annual increase in housing costs of about 4%. And, and clearly we're above that trend line currently. The last 18 months has pushed us well above that line as prices across the United States uh, averaged 19% in increases. And here in the Sun Belt in, in Arizona, especially we've seen 20 to 30% increases in real estate prices, which is definitely above the norm. So how is that gonna, how are we gonna slow that down? Well, the Federal Reserve is now shifting gears. You can go ahead and go to the next slide here. Um, the Federal Reserve is now shifting gears and, and starting to raise interest rates. And there will be some expectation that's going to slow pricing somewhat uh, as the rates go up, even though what they're controlling is the short-term rate, as David pointed out earlier, that will leak into the 10-year treasury, which is what sets the long-term mortgage rates. Uh, but even if they raise rates four times, which is what they're anticipating, let's say that results in four to five percent or four to four and a half percent rise in the mortgage rate and the 30 year mortgage rate. You know, I remember my first mortgage, that's still pretty cheap money, but it will have an impact of raising mortgages and then lowering the amount of money people are going to be able to pay for a house and so forth. But do we think that there is the possibility that we see 19 or 30 percent increases in real estate this year? I, I think that unlikely, 
but I, I don't think we have a collapse in real estate prices either. And, and the main reason is, is this chart right here. We have no inventory. When you take a look at the amount of homes currently available for sale, we have less than half a percent of the total homes in the United States are available for sale. We haven't seen inventory that low since 1965. So higher prices in 2022, I do think it is still likely. Uh, now, the other phenomenon that we uh, are dealing with, of course, is this pandemic. And, and we do believe that the pandemic really was a large driver, not the millennials, a large driver for what we've seen in real estate. And I want to point out, this was not just a U.S.-based phenomenon. We have seen housing prices and low inventory as a global issue, uh, which tends to lead us to believe that the pandemic was one of the core purposes or core reasons for that. As Jake mentioned earlier, we are all very hopeful, having survived the last two years and, and being very tired of going through the last two years, we're all very hopeful. We've reached endemic stage now, and this is going to be nothing more than the flu going forward. Um, obviously, we, we're on the downward trend. Omicron has uh, see, appears to have peaked, uh, still seeing a, a high death rate, but that's typical. It lags after the infection rate. And we're all hopeful that the very next time we talk about the pandemic, it's we're, we're getting a, a flu vaccine and, it, and it's behaving that way. Um, but all of these things have led to a lot of volatility in the market lately. And what that looks like historically, we've forgotten, right? Last year, as Jake pointed out, was pretty benign, not more than a 5% drop at any point in time. So let's take a look historically at the stock market returns and what has happened during the course of a year to remind ourselves that uh, not every day is a positive day in the stock market. So what you see here on the blue line, those are the returns for the S&P 500 since 2000. The orange button there, the brown button, is then the correction, or the deepest correction you will have seen during the course of that year. And what you can see is most years are marked by a pretty sizable or painful correction during the course of the year and we can still have a positive market out of that. So the end result is we expect that 2022 is going to return to normal, hopefully on many levels, but certainly the stock market in January reminded us that life can be a little bit um, uncomfortable sometimes and we have to be patient to, to get through that. So uh, do we expect 2022 to be a more typical year? Yes. Uh, what else do we see coming for 2022? Because we do believe this is a transition year. There are several different paths that this economy can take in the stock market as a result. So let us outline a few of those for you and, and we'll take some extreme cases and then we'll take a look at what we think probably makes the most sense, the base case, if you will. So worst case scenario, we could see the market entering a bear market, which is defined as a correction of 20% or more. The things that could create that bear market, feds make a policy mistake, right? They, uh, they more aggressively raise interest rates or raise them faster than they're currently telegraphing to the markets um, or that their plans for reducing their balance sheet don't quite go as planned, that happens sometimes. And that results in the markets becoming far more volatile and creating a selling uh, panic mentality. What happens if the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, is out of control? That absolutely would add uh, volatility to the market and, and could potentially result in more of a sell-off. You know, obviously we're all hopeful that COVID is, is mostly in the rearview mirror right now. What happens if that's not true? Or what happens if something else comes along? Always a possibility. And then the valuation correction. I mean, just because things are have gotten a little bit cheaper doesn't mean they can't get a whole lot cheaper. We've seen that historically uh, through the economy and in, in market corrections. Now that's a worst case scenario. Let's let's go to the glass more than half full scenario, the, the optimistic view. I could make the case that the market recovers to new highs from here and we end up with gains of over 10% this year. How can you say that? Well, the feds have already let us know what's going to happen. They have told us for interest rate increases. They have told us the first one is going to be in March. The market has actually priced that in already. So the market doesn't like surprises, but if the market gets what the market expects, it can often absorb some of those headwinds without too much of an issue. That could be the case here. The supply chain issues will eventually resolve themselves. If they resolve sooner rather than later, 
Well, then, then those of us who've been saving a lot of money and paying down debt now find ourselves with a lot of disposable income that we can take to the, the grocery store and buy pasta or take to the grocery store or, or to the car dealership. Um, and we can spend money on some of that pent up demand. The consumer is a huge part of the uh, GDP and we could certainly help make the case that GDP continues to expand. And like I said, economy, corporations, consumers, we're all in some of the best shape we've been in, which is an, an it's a bizarre outcome when you consider that just two years ago, we were in a deep uh, recession. So great outcome. But what we think more likely is a balance between those two, our base case. This means markets manage a single digit, a loss or gain. So somewhere between minus 10 and plus 10%. The Federal Reserve obviously is changing policies. So that is going to provide something of a headwind, but we think it perhaps doesn't slow the economy dramatically. You know, supply chain issues will resolve. I think it's gonna take a little longer. We're hearing some pundits say by the end of the summer, that might be a little optimistic, but those things will resolve themselves. <clears throat> and as David pointed out, inflation is gonna be a part of our lives for some of those issues some of those items that are transitory um, and less so for things like, like wage increases a little bit more permanent. Consumers and corporations are strong and we have a normal return to volatility in the market. So that's our base case for 2022. You know, what have you seen in your portfolios here? Well, on the bond side of the equation, probably no surprise. A lot of you have a lot of cash in your portfolios right now because as the interest rates have gone up or the threat of interest rates going up, right? We haven't even seen them go up yet. Uh, the bond values have gone down. So our models have pushed us to cash on high yield municipals, preferred stocks and high yield uh, corporates. We still have some bonds in there that do well in a rising interest rate environment, such as the floating rate. So there is some allocation still there. On the stock side of the equation, we have seen our models in the more actively traded models, we have seen a move towards more value oriented names. You know, think Walmart, not Netflix, for example. That maybe didn't happen as fast as everybody would like it to um, because everything that we use on our models are trend following. Uh, but what you would see right now is that a lot more bent towards the value side of the style box, if you will, than the right side, the growth side of, of things. Uh, so that gives us the 2020 outlook for this year. Jake, I understand we've got quite a few questions. Do you want to go ahead and jump into that? Yeah, we do. <clears throat> um, so, so the first question, uh, there's actually a couple around inflation. So we, we had talked about inflation being around 7%. Uh, real estate was up 20%. Why, you know, how much does real estate go into that CPI number is what they want to know. Um, so Dave, maybe you can talk through yeah. that. So, so when you get down into the nitty gritty on, uh, on, on what the, uh, the CPI numbers are, uh, if you look at shelter, which is, you know, you're talking about your housing costs, uh, the shelter part of it is about 33% of CPI. It's a huge number. Uh, but it's crazy the way they uh, they do it. And, and what Linda was talking about, of uh, you know, average house prices going up 19, 20 percent. They don't look at that at all because they say that's an investment. They look at and at one point they looked and said, what's the cost of owning that house? But that came into what are mortgage rates and they didn't like that. So the majority of it, 75 percent of that calculation is owner's equivalent rent. You say, what the heck is owner's equivalent rent? They basically call people and say, if you own your house, what would you rent it out for if you weren't going to live there? What would you rent it out for this month? And I will tell you, most people have no idea. Uh, they'll know it's uh, higher than it was. Uh, the other 25% is the other as they call people and say, what are you paying for rent? If you're renting the house, what's your rent? Well, if I signed a one-year lease or even a two-year lease two years ago, my rent, what I'm currently paying, is, hasn't changed at all. And yet, if I were to lease that house right now, uh, Linda, I mean, you've got some rental properties, they've gone up dramatically. And so it's a lag effect. And so you say, well, uh, in fact, what they showed was the shelter costs 
uh, last year went up like four, four and a half percent, something like that. And people said, oh, houses are a lot more than that. So it underestimated it for last year. Going forward, it will probably overestimate some of that as it's a lagged indicator. So uh, when people say that doesn't make any sense, absolutely it doesn't make any sense, but that's, it's a government program. So yep. that's the way it works, but that's why it doesn't match up with the, you know, the, the you know, price of housing. And the, the other question kind of relating to inflation with inflation running so high, why is gold not going up? Well, I think that that's a, a conundrum, right? That historically gold has been a good store of value and a safe place to go when we have inflation. I think what we have right now is a headwind for commodities because they don't do well when we have a strong dollar. And, and the fact that we are now starting to practice a little better fiscal policy, right? We're raising interest rates. We're talking about lowering the balance sheet on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Those things are, are good monetary policy. And historically, you get rewarded for good monetary policy with a strong currency. Strong dollar, not so strong on gold. Now, there's also the possibility that uh, Bitcoin and, and some of the, the uh, cryptocurrencies are the replacement for gold. I'll leave that to the speculators to decide. Uh, but we definitely have not seen traction with uh, gold and silver and copper in terms of a, a store of value, even though the inflation conversation has been going on for a while now. Okay, perfect. Uh, another question that came in is <clears throat> around, do we expect a recession in the next year or so? And if so, what will be the implications? Well, you know that that's a that's a hard thing to to forecast. Uh, uh, what what was the old saying of, you know, the, those that know things don't forecast, and those that forecast don't know things. Uh, I mean, that's uh, sort of the way it is. But in the next twelve months, like I, I said before, four percent GDP growth globally. Uh, if we have that, we're not going to have a recession simply because there's still a lot of pent-up demand and, and stuff. But I, I could see a scenario, and this is where we you know, get into that all the car dealerships, all the people that are having shortages of every different kind, they're wanting to order more and more and more because they missed out on sales that they could have had this last year because they didn't have product. And when the supply chains that Linda was talking about, when they come get, get unstuck, you could have everybody get a lot of the orders that they wanted, and now they've got more than they need. And that's typically how recession works. It's not the demand declines that much. It's you get too much inventory, and then you stop ordering. And there's an air pocket to get back to you know, normal inventory levels and stuff. And right now, inventories are dramatically lower than normal. So you've got to you you've got to uh, look at the sales that you're going to have and the replenishing of inventory. Uh, yeah. So I don't see one in the next 12 mm -hmm. months unless the Fed does something really crazy, or you know we have a geopolitical issue that that could blow up at any time, and that so, may, may be the case. So that might be lead us into the next question, which I mean, a lot of people, a lot of clients have on their mind Russia and Ukraine, right? So if there's an invasion by Russia into Ukraine or even China into Taiwan, you know, what do we see the markets doing if that's the case? You know, those are, 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 are big things that it's hard to know, but generally the consensus is any of those or all of those occurring would be a blow to global trade. Uh, there would be sanctions put in place at a bare minimum. Uh, it would disrupt markets, they would go down. I mean, I, I don't see any scenario where you say, you know, one of those uh, uh, conflicts blows up and the markets love it. I mean, long term, uh, one of the things they always talk about is guns and butter of, you know, if you, if you've got an economy not doing very well, go to war and you need guns and butter and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's how you get out of it. But generally when you, uh, a conflict like one of those we're talking about, and I don't think there's a high probability like on Taiwan, there's a higher probability on the Ukraine, but uh, I, I don't see those being, you know, uh, anything but bad for the market. It may not be, it may be temporary because uh, I don't think we're going to really go to war and where we have troops in there on either one of those. Yeah. 
Um, so there's a question relating to the high growth crash a little bit, some momentum stocks not doing well. One of the, and maybe I'll, I'll respond to this a little bit, is certainly we've had a, a tilt towards um, growth over the last several years. Just, and that's been one of the things that's really helped portfolios as a whole. Um, technology, obviously, in any any growth stocks got, has gotten beat up in January. And um, certainly those saw the biggest declines. And one of the things that we've done in there is we've recently changed our five stock strategy to 10 stocks. That's one of the momentum strategies that we have in there. We've, we've doubled the positions just as a way to limit some of the volatility in that space. So that's, that's one change. And, and if you want to talk further about that, we'd, we'd be happy to go into more detail there. But that was one of the questions that, uh, that came up. Um, here's one other question, which is, uh, <clears throat> we've outlined expectations for 2022. What are some of the unexpected things that can happen? So maybe the, what are the unknown unknowns, I guess? Uh, maybe things that we're not looking at. You, you go ahead, Linda. <clears throat> I was going to say you need to get your crystal ball out on this one, right? How do you, if they're unknown, how do you make them known? There's always the potential for some random event to upset the apple cart, and and there's no question that the market doesn't like surprises. So anything that's a surprise is going to result in a near-term uh, movement of a negative correlation to the to a negative correction to the market the the issue will be with that surprise event it does that have persistency is that something like a pandemic who's going to alter the way that we do work and the way that we live for a lengthy period of time so yeah and and you know when i look at everything uh, uh bernard uh, baruch uh, he was a, a renowned uh, financier of the last century one of his quotes was something that everybody knows is not worth knowing. And what he meant by that is if you've got the consensus, then you need to look outside that box. And, and when I look at it, of uh, people saying, yep, the supply chain, it's going to be, and a lot of people are saying it's going to be <clears throat> the end of the year or even in 2023 before that gets fixed. If it were to get fixed by middle of the summer uh, in a lot of ways, uh, you, you, you could see uh, basically an oversupply of stuff uh, and you could see a deflationary pressure. Uh, one of the things that you look at like on uh, that, that is pushed up, not just the, the shelter cost, but new and used car prices. I mean, uh, I think I mentioned 30 percent used car price increase in the, in the last two years. <clears throat> well, I can tell you it's not going to continue at a 30 percent rate and it probably goes back down. I mean, there are people that you know, bought a, a car a year ago that can sell it for more than they bought it new. I mean, that, that, that makes no sense at all. And when that shortage gets alleviated, those, those prices are gonna go down. So I can come up with a scenario that we think inflation is gonna you know, be bad this year and that by you know, middle of the summer, end of the summer, all of a sudden it's going the other way. And that would be a big boost ultimately to, uh, to, to, to the stock market from the standpoint of, of the Fed's actions won't be needed as much. Now, if it causes a, a, a recession, you know, six months or eight months down the road, different story there. But I think there's some of those that could. Inflation is, is one, uh, you know, uh, if, if stock market, you know, goes, goes a lot higher, uh, like I said, you know, those type of bubbles can continue for years. Uh, and, and maybe those 3 million people that have left the workforce, if COVID sort of gets under control, maybe they send their kids back to daycare and they go back to the workforce or they send grandma to, you know, the assisted living and they go back to the workforce. I mean, that would alleviate a lot of the wage pressure. I mean, it doesn't take away there. You're not going to reduce people's wages, but you wouldn't have to increase them as much. And I will tell you, the increase in wages is actually that we've seen the last year is long time in coming for the average worker, because after the Great Recession, if you adjust for inflation, a lot of the average workers are making less a year ago than they were 10 years before. 
and you need them to get a strong economy, you've got to have the middle class, the average worker making more money each year. And I will tell you, the pandemic has helped in productivity. Uh, companies have figured out how to work leaner, uh, more flexible. If they're more flexible and their employees are happier, they're more productive. There, there is some good things coming out of the pandemic. I, I think going forward out of the pandemic, you'll see less flu cases because people will not go to school and will not go to work sick like they have in the past. So there's always some good and there's some bad. So one other question, uh, maybe to wrap it up here is what happens if oil goes above a hundred dollars a barrel? I think we're, it's trading at, you know, high eighties, low nineties, right? So, um, uh, any major, any comments on that? Linda, you want to talk about it or you want me to jump in on it? Uh, you know, my personal opinion, if oil goes a little bit higher, I think we can tolerate it because <coughs> it's less a part of the household budget now than it used to be. Yep. Um, and and especially with as many people as have moved to hybrid cars and electric cars, it's it's definitely consumption per household is down quite a bit. So we can probably tolerate that better. You, you had a different spin on that, David? No, I, th I think that's exactly right. I, I've actually been surprised that OPEC and OPEC Plus, which includes uh, Russia, has been able to hold prices like they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people said, well, as soon as prices get above $70, $80 a barrel, all the fracking in the U.S. And, and we're where most of the decline in production has come yep. because we do fracking. And, you know, the decline of production on fracking is dra dramatic in the first two years, especially in the first 12 months. So, but I'm, I'm seeing, you know, a lot of the big players in fracking in the U.S. are not going to grow 20% this year. They're looking and saying, we saw what had happened last time and it pushed prices down. Let's be more disciplined in doing that. And so I think the 70 to 90 or $100 a barrel probably stays there. If we get a Ukrainian problem or anything like that, or Iran, those are some outliers that could blow that up. I mean, literally, uh, it, it, the, the, you could see, because we've got 100 million barrels a day that we use, and we dropped 2 million barrels in the last couple of years with the pandemic, and it's, it's very inelastic. I mean, you drop 5 million barrels, and it goes up, you know, 30, 40 percent. I mean, uh, so, so we'll see, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't surprise me to get to a hundred dollars a barrel. Uh, I mean, we got to over a hundred dollars a barrel back in 2008 and that was, you know, 14 years ago. So it can happen, but do we think it, I, I, I don't, especially with the trends of more, more electric vehicles and stuff, but just global growth. I mean, it's funny because you, you, you've got to use oil to be able to make those electric vehicles. <laughs> yeah. So the more you do those things, you're still going to use it. You're just not, and, and Linda's exactly correct. When we look, say, oh, I, but I remember back in the seventies when it you know went from $3 to $30, it was a disaster, but you are also getting 10 miles a gallon on your car um, and your, your furnace and all of those things, you know, were, are much more efficient now. So not, not as a big a deal. And you're seeing that in the S&P. I think the, uh, at one point, uh, uh, oil companies were 15, 18 percent of the S&P. I think they're now like six percent. I mean, less. Yeah. 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 So, so I think that's a good place to stop here. I mean, we've outlined a lot of different risks that we see, right? And that's kind of our job, right? To outline, you know, some of the risks and some of the things we need to be cautious of, um, especially given the volatility we've seen here recently. But there, there's clearly a lot of positives. And I think that's some of the things you talked about, David, just the consumer being in some of the best shape, the job market being really good, corporations being really strong, and you know the economy's growing, growing healthily right now. So lots of positives, and I think that bodes well. Um, if we didn't get to your question, um, uh, we'll reach out to you uh, individually. Uh, we appreciate everybody attending. There's two, two other items we just want to make you aware of. Uh, tax, tax forms, uh, some have already come out, um, but through the month of February, those will be getting out to you and there'll be some corrections along the way. So just be aware, don't send those into your CPA too early because likely they'll, they'll be a corrected 1099 that, that you may get. So usually we tell people, wait till probably the end of February, maybe early March. 
And then the last thing is we, as we've done in the past, we are going to have us, we're hoping to have a spring training mm -hmm. event. Um, there's a lockout going on with baseball. And so we'll see if that happens, but we'll be sending out an email um, shortly that will give some additional details on that. So be on the lookout for that. So we appreciate you attending and uh, listening to our comments and we'll look forward to talking to you this quarter. Everybody stay safe and, and stay healthy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.